Hey, we're so glad that you streamed in tonight. That's BFF Chevyville. Do me a favor. Don't forget to like uh, the sermon here. Comment as I'm preaching. Forward it out to your friends. I'm praying that you're experiencing the goodness and the presence of God. You are not here in the room with us, but I pray you feel the same anointing as if we were in the same room. Let's connect in faith and let's see God do incredible things. Let's pray for a moment. Father, I thank you for what we're about to experience. I thank you that tonight we're going to learn how to become, overcome being double-minded. And I thank you that we shall learn and grow in you in these times. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to talk tonight. I'm in a series called Minded. And tonight I'm going to talk about how to overcome being double-minded. Let me start by saying that everything that we need, God has it. But being double-minded will stop you from receiving what God has for you. Now, this is not a fussing message. I'm going to tell you, if you had more faith, you'd have what God wants you to have. If you had more faith, you wouldn't be in a situation you're in now. What's wrong with the church in the world now is we don't have enough faith. That's not this message. I'm going to teach you how God is working with me, how to overcome my double-mindedness, to receive the protection, the provision, the peace, everything that God has for me in this moment. James chapter 1, verse 5, if you look on the screen, it's right there. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. You know what that means? God won't make you feel stupid for asking him a question. And it will be given to him. Verse 6 says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7 says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Double-minded is when you have this war on the inside of you, uh, this war that calls you to go back and forth. Let me describe to you what this person looks like. Um, they talk a good game. I'm going to be there. Hey, we're going to work out tomorrow. I'm going to meet you at 6. We're going to go walk. Y'all, I got my clothes laid out, and you show up at 6, and they don't show up. They're untrustworthy, and they're not stable because they meant well, but when time came to get up, get up it was hard to do it. Double-minded. I want to get in shape. I want to do better, but the bed calls me. It just hugs me. It keeps me in there. It's unstable. Another part of uh, double-minded people is they, they live by a double standard. Uh, they do one thing and expect another. They'll get mad at you for doing the same thing that uh, you, they did to you. So think about this. The same person that slept in and stood you up uh, for working out will be the same person you see posted on social media. All these people in the world are fake and this and that, and they neglect to look at the things, the inconsistencies in their own life. It's not that we don't mean well. It's just that we have this war on the inside of us, and God says, I want you to overcome this war so that you can become stable because I got some great things for you. So here's the main idea of tonight, uh, tonight's lesson. Being double-minded keeps you from receiving from God. Being single-minded allows you to receive what God has from you, and it brings stability in your life. Here's what I love about God. God gives without discrimination. He gives without accusation, and he gives without reproach, meaning that God doesn't care what color I am. He doesn't care what gender I am. He doesn't, he does, he's not looking at my past track record. He's not holding all these things against me to remind me when I ask him for help. When I come single-minded, convicted, and focused, God said, I'll give you what you need when you become single-minded. So I want to help you to become single-minded. Let me give you a couple principles of single-minded. I wanted to find a scripture in the Bible. I know James talks about it, what describes a double-minded man. But I wanted to find an actual story in the Bible we could put ourselves in it that you could show you how to become single-minded. And there's a, in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, it'd be great if you just follow along with me at home, just on your smartphone, or uh, I know you may be watching me uh, on your phone, but maybe you got a tablet or your Bible there. Go to Mark chapter 9, verse 23. And there was a father who had a son who was demon-possessed. Some may say he had epileptic uh, seizures, but Jesus recognized it was something greater than that. And he would throw himself on the floor and foam at the mouth. It was a mute spirit. And the thing about this, they were superstitious back in the day, and they thought this was one of the hardest demons to cast out because when they cast out demons, they always wanted to ask the demon, what is your name? Thus, you see in the Bible, when Jesus cast a, a demon out, he's asking, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. But this demon was a mute spirit. And he would throw this guy on the, he would throw the son on the floor, and the father was so just distraught, he took him to the disciples, and the disciples tried to pray for him, and it didn't work. Then he finally met up with Jesus, and he had this discourse with Jesus. And I want to 
uh, eavesdrop in on their conversation. Mark 9, 23 says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Verse 24 says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. This one sentence characterizes the battle that double-minded uh, people face. I believe, but God help my unbelief. I'm caught in a battle. I believe you can, just not sure you will. This guy made this statement because he had a son with a demon that he was trying to get cast out. But all of us can put ourselves in this story. You may not have a son or a child that was possessed with a demon, but you got something in your life. We all do that we're trying to get uh, God to deal with. We're trying to get solved, but it's just not working. And over time, it just starts to wear on you and you just start to wonder, God, can you do this? God, when are you going to do this? I want to help you out tonight. We all have failed attempts of victory that we have the same struggle. Well, we say, I believe, but God helped my unbelief. You know what it sounds like? I believe that you're God. You had a son named Jesus that died on the cross for my sin. Uh, some of you may be struggling with that right now. It's okay. God will make a believer out of you. I believe you sent your son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, I believe you sent your son, Jesus. And I believe you sent the Holy Spirit. And if you were like me, you tarried for the Holy Spirit till you spoke in tongues. And you just, now you got power to walk right and talk right and all that stuff. You believe in all that stuff. But there's a challenge. You got failed attempts in your life where you tried to do stuff and it didn't work. I've asked God a lot of questions. God, I, I, I thought you were going to let me get in physical therapy school. I applied three times and didn't get in and had to redirect my whole career. I got failed attempts. I got facts and reality. The CDC is saying this. Uh, the statistics are saying this. The facts are saying this. I believe that you're a healer, but they're telling me all these things and the death count is rising. And God, I'm nervous. What do I do? I got pain. I believe you're a healer, but I got pains and, and symptoms in my body. I believe that you have grace and mercy, but if you have all this grace and you have all this mercy, why do I still struggle with this guilt? I believe you can do anything and nothing is impossible for you, but I'm also a realist. And I believe you can, but will you for me? Believing when you really believe what God says, which I'm going to walk you through, uh, to, shows you how God will work in your life and how you can receive. Can I teach you for a moment? I want to show you how to get to a point where you believe. Because you, you just don't walk up and just believe something. Believing is something that it takes time to get to that point because when you believe something, you have a conviction about it. The first step on how do you believe, Jesus showed us here in Scripture, and I want to dig more in Mark chapter 9. You got to unarm unbelief. Unarm unbelief. Mark chapter 9, notice what Jesus, he's pretty smooth leader. He walked up to the guy, and his son is on the ground, frothing at the mouth, and the father's all distraught. You know how we are. Uh, when you're distraught, it's hard to get people to listen. So Jesus calmly said to him, he asked his father, how long has he been doing this? Pretty sure that stopped the father in his track. Here's what unbelief comes from. Jesus knew that the boy, he had brought the boy to his disciples and failed. Unbelief comes from a result of prior failed attempts, yours or others, that you've seen people try stuff and it didn't work. You tried things and it didn't work. And you started out here, but slowly after every failed attempt, you start walking it down. And it results in being double-minded because you want to try it, but your trust is not all the way there. That's why double-minded is not solved in the head. Double-minded is solved in the heart. It's healed in the heart. Because double-minded is an unbelief problem, which comes from your heart, and it impacts the way you think. Your belief is your trust. So unbelief is a lack of trust. And if we are struggling with anything now in this society, in this culture, people really don't trust anybody. We have a hard time really fully trusting people. You may ask, but you always set yourself up just in case that this doesn't happen. And people are asking questions, who do I trust? And I think instead of asking who you should trust, I think you should ask, how should I trust? Because I don't trust everybody to the same degree. I trust to the degree that you can deliver on your promise. And here's the thing about trust. It's not verbal. It's behavioral. That's why when you lose trust, you can't rebuild it with a conversation. You got to rebuild it with a lifestyle. So Jesus knew all of this stuff. He knew the guy was struggling with unbelief. So he pulled him in with a question. Tell me how long he's been dealing with this. He located the man because he's pulling him in so he can unarm his unbelief. 
and get him to a point where he does believe. He was moving him mentally to a place where he got his confidence back up through a conversation. Oh, this guy cares. Oh, he's, no, he, he's not just going to come in and lay hands and make assumptions about the situation. He's going to ask me, how long have I been here? Jesus knew the guy had failed attempts, so he unarmed his unbelief. What did he do next? To next, to get to the point of believing, you got to understand the power of if. You got to understand the power of if. You keep reading in that scripture. After Jesus asked the guy, how long has he been doing this? The guy said, listen, Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. The guy's if put his faith and he projected his problem on Jesus. That's what many of us do. Many of us are walking around insecure, not because you got problems, but because people projected their problems onto you. And the guy put his lack of faith, his lack of unbelief after Jesus located him. He told him where he was. He said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. I love what Jesus did. Jesus turned it right back on him. He said, no, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. What Jesus did is he challenged the guy's unbelief to pull him out of that moment to get him to a place of believing. My question for you is, can you trust God? Can you get to the place where you believe? Notice, he didn't ask anybody around there. He didn't ask the disciples who tried to cast the demon out if they believe. He didn't ask his neighbor across the street. He said, listen, I want to know this. Do you believe? Here's my question for you tonight. Do you believe that God can bring you out? Do you believe that God can heal you? Do you believe that God can set you free? Watch this, because believing is a matter of trusting. And I want you to be honest with yourself and say, do I really trust God in this situation? Jesus said, if you trust me, all things are possible if you'll just believe. Here is a challenge with many of us, particularly myself. We are more intimidated by our current situation than we are going on the other side of believing that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. If we really trusted God, I think things would be different. If we really trusted God, I think we would sleep at night. And therein lies the problem. God, I trust you, but I see what I see. And God is saying this, faith is not what you see. Faith is believing in me because what you see is temporary. But what I have that is not seen is greater than anything that you see in your life. I had a situation in my own life where God had to get me to the point where I trusted him. I was in debt. I was single, and I was in a lot of debt. Debt to the point where my car note was greater than my rent. And I was end up paying my cable bill uh, with my credit card. And when I paid my cre- uh, credit, uh, cable bill with my credit card, I said, enough is enough. And I remember I used to be the sound man at our church. We had a little analog board, and I did, just thank God it worked. That's all I wanted to say. And I was sitting in the sound booth, and I was sitting there, and I looked at my bills, and I had a bill collector call me from a credit card because I had a credit card at every department store. We wore suits and all that stuff like that back then with the church I went to. And I had to be clean. And I said, God, if you get me out of this, I promise you, I I, I don't know how you can do it, but God, I heard about you doing this before, but get me out of debt. And in that moment, the Lord began to minister to me. He said, Jason, do you really think I can? I said, of course you can. I wouldn't be asking if I didn't think you would. He said, this is what I want you to do. I went from living by myself to finding a roommate. I went to downsizing on certain things. I stopped buying new stuff. These are all the things God was telling me to do. It was not comfortable. I went from eating out at lunch every day to I went and got bologna and cheese and SpaghettiOs. I worked 10 minutes from where I lived, 10 minutes from where I worked. So I start going home. I cut my budget in half. I streamlined things. And can I tell you guys, something miraculous happened. Not only did I start to streamline my life, but the Lord allowed a job offer that took me all the way across the country that doubled my salary. And the bonus paid off the debt that I had right there in that moment. Everything except for my car. I can manage my car note then and my student loan. But I was in a place of God. I believe you can. I'm not sure you will. But I saw the will of God happen when I began to follow the plan of God. The plan of God, when you follow it, it says, God, I trust you and I'll take you at your word. Here's what happens is the last point is this. Helping your unbelief is on God, not on you. I love what the guy said. It showed his lack of faith. But he put it back on God because that's where his help comes from. He said, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. And when you ask God for help, guess what? He shows up right when you need him. Willpower can't help you. Trying hard can't help you. Human effort cannot help you. It's going over things over and over again in your mind cannot help you. What helps unbelief 
is when you finally get convinced that God can do the impossible in my life because if is an invitation for me to walk in a level of impossibility to see the possibility of God. Believing is on me, but the helping is on God. Oh, but here's the challenge. When many of us ask for help, we really don't want help. What many of us are asking for when we ask for help, we want people to come cheerlead our failure. We want them to come watch us do wrong. Because anytime they try to interject, we get sensitive, we get offended. But no, when you ask for help, sometimes you got to take a step back and say, what I'm doing is not working, God. I've tried all this. I've tried all that. I'm ready to try you. And you got to suspend your judgment for a moment because God will send himself. He'll send himself through people. And when you ask for help, you got to be ready to receive it. Learn that the hard way. Here's what happens when this guy allowed God to help him. He saw the possibility of God. He trusted God. So apparently, you know what? Can you imagine you having a child in this condition? You don't just let anybody deal with him. I imagine he took a step back and said, Jesus, do your work. Mark 9, 25 says this. When Jesus saw the people come running together, here's what he did. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. God said, when you come out this time, you're not going back in the same place that you went into before. Verse 26 says, then the spirit cried out. Notice it was deaf and mute. Now it's talking. Convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and arose him. Here's what happens when you get the help of God when you start believing. When you say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do what you said. God's going to rebuke the thing that you're dealing with. I don't care what it is. If it's not sent from God, it is illegal. People have this thing backwards. They say, man, God is the one that gave me casting. God is the one that sent this virus. God can't rebuke what he sent. He can't give you what he don't have. Cancer ain't in heaven. Corona's not in heaven. He can't give you what he doesn't have, so he wants to rebuke the thing that you do have that he didn't give to you to make room for the thing that he wants you to have. He rebuked it and commanded it to leave and said this, don't come back. You're not welcome here anymore. And then... This is where the real help came in. He lifted him up by the hand and walked and lifted him up and took him to the place where he needed to be. Here's what happens when you really start believing and trusting God. He gives you a plan. He helps settle that battle between I believe but help my unbelief. He rebuke the thing you're dealing with because you can't do it. It's a heart issue, not a head issue. Then he will command it not to come back no more. Them tormenting dreams, those thoughts that you're having in your head, he'll say you're not legal anymore. I'm going to give you power and dominion over them, and then he'll lift you up from where you are. I don't know where you are right now, but God will lift you up. He'll put you in a place of stability. Right now, you could be all over the place. You could actually be dealing with symptoms from this virus. You could actually have it. You could be dealing with financial problems. You could be dealing with whatever. whatever. I want to tell you here, settle yourself. I know you got doubts, and you're saying, God, I believe what the Bible says, but God help my unbelief. Because while I'm believing, I'm in pain. While I'm believing, I still got this debt. I need a plan to walk me out of this. And here's what God's saying. I want you to step back, and I'm going to give you the help. But here's the thing. When I give you the help, I want you to take it. And it's going to lift you up and put you in a place of stability. God has the power to lift you up from where you are and to cause stability to come in your life. I don't care what it is that you're dealing with. God can stabilize your situation, whether you're dealing with the symptoms of the actual virus that's going on right now, whether you actually have it, whether you have financial challenges, whatever's going on in your life, it is not impossible. With man, man, it may be impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And as you trust his word, single focused on what he said, as we get ready to go into prayer, you're going to feel your faith arise. It may not change immediately, but it's going to change. And God's going to rebuke the thing that you're dealing with. He's going to command it not to come back, to leave and to not come back, and he's going to lift you up in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for stability. I thank you that you are the stability of our times. I thank you that you rebuke everything that is not like you. And you commanded us to rise from the ashes right now in the name of Jesus. I want to speak to your spirit as you're listening to me. You shall live and not die. God is going to help your unbelief by rebuilding your trust 
as you say, help me, God. And God saying, if you trust me, you'll see the miraculous things happen in your life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.